Okay, um, good evening and um, welcome to BNP Live. I'm Brad Graham, the co-owner of Politics and Prose, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine. And we're very delighted to have with us this evening, legal expert, Laura Coates, here to talk about her powerful and passionate new book, Just Pursuit, A Black Prosecutor's Fight for Justice. A couple of brief housekeeping notes first though, post a question at any point during this evening's discussion, just click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. And in the chat column, you'll find a link for purchasing additional copies of Just Pursuit. Or as a senior legal analyst on CNN, a host on Sirius XM, and an adjunct law professor at George Washington University School. Early in her legal career, she was in private practice as an intellectual property litigator with an expertise in First Amendment and media law. Then she joined the Justice Department as a trial attorney in the Civil Rights Division, specializing in the enforcement of voting rights. And later, she served as an assistant U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia, prosecuting violent felony offenses. Her new book draws on her Justice Department experiences and provides a searing firsthand account of injustice and ineptitude in the judicial system. Through a collection of engaging vignettes, Laura presents her case and tracks her own disillusionment. But she had high hopes when she became a prosecutor she writes that her work ended up putting her at odds with her principles and her experience as a black woman and caused her to question her own role in the criminal justice system. As she says, her story sharply illuminate the problem of defining and achieving justice in the midst of an ongoing racial reckoning in this country. Review in Kirkus called Just Pursuit, sobering reading and an eloquent case for reform for a more equitable distribution of justice. And here's a news flash. We learned earlier today that the book has landed on the New York Times bestseller list. So that's very exciting news. Now in um, conversation with Laura, will be a face that's sure familiar to uh, many others who tune in regularly to uh, PNP. And that's journalist April Ryan, White House correspondent and Washington DC bureau chief for the GRIO digital TV channel and website. April also is a political analyst on CNN and she's written three books, The Presidency in Black and White, At Mama's Knee, Mothers in Race in Black and White, and most recently, Under Fire, reporting from the front lines of the Trump White House. So uh, Laura and April, the screen is yours. Thanks, Brad. Thank well, I am so excited tonight. Number one, um, I have to congratulate my friend, Laura Coates. Laura, congratulations tonight of all nights for being named <laughs> on, the, for being on the New York Times bestsellers list. You made it to the list. Congratulations. I, I cannot, April, I am so grateful for you for being here tonight and for this invitation for politics and prose. And I just, I cannot tell you, sometimes they tell you your cup runneth over. That's how Ooh. I feel tonight. And I, I feel that I actually have a, a tea cup that's running over as well, but I really do feel as though this is something- You're gonna that, spill the tea with that. I'm, right? I'm gonna spill the tea, but not on me. <laughs> <laughs> but I tell you, it's been such a beautiful experience. It's a very vulnerable, you know, what a very vulnerable experience it is to write and to do oh. it from such a personal perspective as I did in this book. I was often afraid about what I was doing and wondering if I um, should continue and should be as personal and candid. And I'm just overwhelmed by the reception and the statements people have made and the way it's resonated. And I, I can't thank everyone enough. And I'm so glad to have this opportunity to talk about it too. Yeah, but once again, congratulations. And for all of you, we did do the Black Girl Magic Dance before we came we on. <laughs> Celebrating, you know, she was saying how she was in tears when she found out. And when I got the email, I was screaming. I was just overjoyed for you because I've seen you work. I've seen you work hard. I've seen you, um, as we talk about peeling the layers off and taking the veil off so people can see, I've seen you as a mother with your two children. When you're going on to CNN, have them sitting in the green room. This is before mm -hmm. COVID doing mm -hmm. their work and being a mother, being a consummate professional, giving us the legal analysis that we need. And um, before we go into your book, I need some legal analysis from you right now. Mm. As 
senior uh, legal analyst at CNN. There's news tonight. Uh, I think I heard something. <laughs> yes, something Supreme today. Court. Something. something. Supreme something. Court Justice Stephen Breyer is retiring after 28 years. Mm -hmm. And the official announcement is tomorrow. And we also understand that um, the president uh, Jen Psaki said that the president is going to stand by his promise. He will nominate a black woman to be the next Supreme Court justice. What are your thoughts on all of this, particularly as it relates to a black woman being on the Supreme Court? I cannot tell you how thrilled and excited I am at this very prospect. April, what it would mean to me as a black woman lawyer is something that I don't know if I could ever convey because it's such a sense of pride, not only to know that it's being considered, and of course it should have been considered long ago. And this country should not be in a position where we believe that the default option for intellect, the default mm -hmm. option and who is the knee jerk reaction of who fits the description of somebody who could be on the Supreme Court is simply going to be either a white man as it has been traditionally, or in more recent years, anyone but a black woman. And I know that there is an embarrassment of riches to think about all of the qualified, more than qualified, exceptionally talented advocates on the bench at the appellate level and quorums across like this country who would be continually revered for their minds for their ability to synthesize information, for their ability to be impartial, and for them to bring unapologetically their entire selves into the courtroom. And that's important because I think when we talk about the justice system or the laws, we think about it just in terms of how to interpret the words on a page. But it's about why people have to think about the way we think about the Constitution mm -hmm. and the laws that our Congress creates and how they're interpreted and how people are aggrieved through a more diverse perspective of people with lived experiences in different categories. And when President Biden made that statement, I think as black women, we probably remember this notion of black girl magic and the way it's often coveted and used around the election and coveted as a black woman's vote. But then backs are turned when it's come time to actually pay the piper and the sort of what you promised to do. And it will be refreshing, frankly, that this will happen. And people think about the Supreme Court and they wonder, when was the last time I saw a black woman who was a central figure in a Supreme Court nomination and confirmation? And they may think of Anita Hill, who herself, because of her experience with the seat of Justice Clarence Thomas, is often categorized as a sort of a tangential figure as opposed to what her own intellectual capabilities are as a consummate lawyer and scholar. And so I am just so proud and I'm so excited that finally black women can stop being told to wait your turn or be satisfied that, well, there's a woman there. Isn't that enough for you? And with this docket, April, I mean, right now, obviously talking about Justice Breyer is going to stay out this term, which means that they will have decided the Mississippi abortion ban case yes. and, and its progeny with Texas, et cetera. But wouldn't it be important to have a black woman's perspective on an area of the law that we know has a disproportionate impact for a variety of factors on black women in Mississippi and other places. How about and voting that, rights? Right, and that, but that Mississippi case could totally overturn Roe v. Wade. It is yeah. so critical, you're absolutely right. And yes, let's go to voting rights. Voting rights, we're mm -hmm. now voting without the full protections of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. You know, I was a prosecutor in the Civil Rights Division voting section when we still had the benefit of Section 5. And just so people understand what we're talking about. Section 5 is essentially nipping discrimination in the bud. Any voting related change you want to make with respect to an area that has a history of discrimination, you have to clear with the Civil Rights Division. That's a good thing, April, because that means that before you even begin to make changes that are going to have a discriminatory impact, let alone will actually do that, that someone can say, no, like, let, let, nice try. Go back to the drawing board and think of a way to comply with this valuable legislation. Then I was there before the Supreme Court rendered anemic section two, making it harder to challenge it even after the law has been implemented. 
And even yeah. then it was difficult, April. As you know, you were a reporter on the front lines thinking about what the impact of our elections were. And it's not coincidental that the very thing they want to take away is what you really need most. And so if even with that benefit, it was difficult. Imagine what it's like now as it's being clawed back. And so right. I want a black woman on the Supreme Court who's looking at these issues from the context. I'm not assuming or giving a foregone conclusion of what her holding might be, but I want her in the room where it happens. And I want her to be a decision maker at that seat at the table. All right, with your Hamilton reference in the room where it happens. Hashtag Aaron Burr. <laughs> <laughs> hey, not Burr. So look, so in the last question on this, because this is a big news day and your voice is so impactful and so important, particularly at a time like this with this New York Times bestseller right here, Just Pursuit. Who do you want to see the president nominate? Because he has a short list mm -hmm. of black women who have a pedigree that even could surpass some of these uh, white men who people would think should be in the room where it happens. Who do you think should be the justice nominee? You know, the truth of the matter is, April, if you looked at that screenshot of the people on that short list, I didn't see a bad choice. Mm -hmm. And that is a testament to the intellectual prowess of these women. It's not as if people are being asked to pick a black woman out of oblivion and, oh, you'll do by virtue of your race and gender. We're talking about an abundance of qualifications. A couple come to mind. I mean, I, I was a year behind in school Judge Candace Jackson at Princeton. She was a oh. formidable intellectual force then. I knew that when I was 17 years old. I'm looking at the likes of Judge Mimi Wright out of my own home state of Minnesota, who has served at the state appellate level, the state Supreme Court level, and now a federal district judge. I'm looking at people like Judge Katanji Brown, who, who Jackson, who of course is somebody who was on the Sentencing Commission, somebody who has been a Supreme Court clerk for Justice Breyer, Justice somebody Breyer. who's in this coveted role, frankly, of a court feeder of the DC Circuit who stepped in when now Attorney General Garland's spot was vacant. There are so many more. There's a Supreme Court Justice in California. I could go down the line and each could be sung of their praises. But I think what I'm looking for, and I, I wonder if you, what well, your thoughts to this too, April, I'm already seeing that there are questions about, well, how are they experienced enough? Well, have they been on the pellet bench long enough? Questions that weren't asked for Justice Amy Coney Barrett, right. who had a very short tenure. Questions that weren't asked when, well, not wholesomely, when they were asked about Justice Lena Kagan, who never served as a judge for a single day before taking the bench. And Maybe you don't, don't have to be a judge to be on the U.S. Supreme no. Court. And I think about that when you talk about people like Sherlyn Eiffel, right? Mm. Um, and, and this president is enamored with Sherlyn Eiffel's mind when she comes to the table on issues of civil rights from, from Haiti to voting rights to policing. So the list is long, the list is a list of pedigreed women, whether mm. they're judges or whether they are in the legal field. Um, so true. And, and, yeah, right, and, and, my, and, and my take on it, as you said, I want to see who he picks, but the question is, how will the confirmation hearings go? Because you know, there is um, an uphill battle, number one, for anyone that this president will nominate, but then add in the historic nature of his nominee. Well, here's the good thing though. When we think about the Senate, who has the role of advising and consenting for these judicial nominees, mm -hmm. the Senate has become almost a synonymous discussion point about the filibuster. Guess what? It's not an yeah. issue here, right? right? It's no longer an issue in terms of thinking about that. And guess what? Some of these judges were recently confirmed on a bipartisan basis. So anyone who endeavors to now question their integrity or abilities when a Supreme Court vacancy opens up, that was not there for another lifetime position and an Article Three court, well, then I'm looking to see where that hypocrisy lies. And I just want, no one's ever entitled to the position, but they ought to have a right to be able to have equal access and to be fairly treated and to have an opportunity to demonstrate why they should be there. And each of those women ought to get the same consideration that any of the other justices have. The mind of New York Times best-selling author. Don't you like that? 
Laura. Hold on, my foot's asleep. Let me move. Yep. I mean, <laughs> just pursue. Laura, just like you regaled us just now on this topic of the president's potential pick for um, Supreme Court Black woman, um, you came to us with so many stories that tugged at my heart as a Black woman. You are in a field that has sometimes come against the community and you started out in chapter one, that was kind of heart wrenching. And then there was another chapter, chapter two, and I'm gonna read a piece of chapter two um, because it's really, um, it tugged at me on so many, there was such irony there. But talk to me about chapter one. As a prosecutor, you were dealing with a victim. You had, you were representing a victim and the victim uh, had, you tell the story, the vi you ultimately had to turn the victim in. Talk to me about that. You know, in my commentary, as you know, I suffer no fools and I don't exclude myself from the, excuse me, from that sort of scrutiny. And I launch right into the book to really show the personal battles of allegiance that I was grappling with, with being a black woman, having my moral compass point one direction and the orders of the office pointing a very different direction. And I, I launched the book talking about how the pursuit of justice creates yeah. injustice. And people think that's a very odd statement to make, but that first chapter explains why. In a run-of-the-mill car theft case, which frankly is light work for a prosecutor knowing you have the suspect, the victim whose car was stolen and turned out to be an undocumented person living in this country illegally for decades, had not so much as sneezed in the direction of a police officer in the decades that he remained, had, reigned, had raised his family, was gainfully employed, and when his car was stolen, he did what we ask people to do, report the crime. Now I, in preparing for trial in a case I had inherited, had to do a routine background check on everyone who might come into the courtroom. So the marshals could be aware if there was any active warrant or if there was a safety issue for anyone. You do it sort of a, um, a routine background check. Well, his pinged as an active deportation warrant. And in those moments, I had to, and I tried not to, but I had to consider what I would do in that moment. Would I follow what I thought was right, which is somebody ought not to be victimized and turned in for deportation if they're a victim of a crime? They're not the same, quote unquote, level of a criminal, if at all, and the person who has committed this car theft, but the directors of the office say, Active mm -hmm. warrant must turn in. And I write about the emotional experience, not just from my own. I don't ever, April, want to suggest that what I was grappling with somehow matches what he was going through as ICE agents were in the building. But mm -hmm. I write about that tension of what it's like to be a Black woman feeling a kindred spirit with others who have been marginalized. And knowing what was lawful did not feel right. Hmm. So at the end of the day, ICE was involved. Mm -hmm. ICE was involved. ICE was involved. You're, yeah. you're, you're taking responsibility and working with a victim. And then you had to, in turn, reach out to ICE. You did yeah. a hypothetical at first. I mean, that was a lot. And you start the book out this way. And then, then the next chapter, I mean, there are stories here that just pull at your heart. Chapter two, I want to see something funny mm. on being trained by a white male colleague, how to interrogate a black defendant. I was like, wait a minute, let me go to, you see, I got my little- I see the tabs, I see the tabs. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? The right. tabs are funny. The experience don't, don't was not. And I let know. me tell you, you know, I'm sure we all have had moments of being mansplained, right? Or somebody. Let me, let me let me let me let yeah. me read this first, and then I oh, want sure. you to explain it. Let yeah. me read. Okay, so this is your night. Sit back, spill your tea as you drink it. Okay, spill a little bit of tea. So, okay, here, uh, page twenty-eight. I told you, I train you. You're going to thank me for this one. Hmm. This must be good. Then I said, giggling at his giddiness. Seven minutes later, here I was as expectant and nervous as a person uh, chained before me, self-conscious about what I didn't know or what would be asked of me. What you'd say, the young man asked, bringing me back to the moment. I asked 
if you were all right. I repeated, raising my voice. I slid the tissue off my hand, balling it up into my other hand. She had cut her finger uh, just before that. So moving back into page 29, he lifted his hands and showed me his chains covering his teeth with pursed lips and raised his eyebrows with derision. His hands lingered for emphasis before he said, this is how I'm doing. His mouth fell open and breathed through it. Come on, come on now. Talk to me, I mean, with chains. Mm. He showed me his chains. He showed me his chains and a white man told you how to deal with the defendant as the defendant and you ask, how are you doing? And it, he was shackled. There's so much in that chapter, not, not the least of which is that, you know, how it begins is here I am balancing a variety of cases and thinking that someone was presenting a moment of levity and the punchline was a chained black man in the basement of our building. I mean, just think about that how it was prefaced to me. Do you want to see something funny? And I would challenge anyone to find the humor in a moment like that. I certainly never did. But what it showed me in many respects, and you juxtapose the humanity of what this person was showing me, chained though he was, versus my colleague who thought, yeah. let me show you how it's done. And I assume you want to emulate. And it shows you in many respects, not only the, the the range of those who are honorable in the profession and how they wield power and those who covet it only to exploit it and say, find some sort of perverse sense of satisfaction. But I also can't distance myself from that moment because as much as I would like to say, and I knew what I didn't know in approaching the circumstances, I was complicit in my very presence to the person who was chained. There was no distinguishing me from my colleague and I wondered and had a very introspective moment and it followed and it really guided how I approached many of my cases of this notion of the us versus them. And it wasn't enough to feel that I was distinct and that I was doing the right things. I had to demonstrate it. I had to, through my own action, through my own public service and remembering, God, what was it about me that you thought I endeavored to emulate this? Right. So let's, and with that, I mean, you've got so many poignant um, anecdotes. You've got so many poignant moments that we, we have to skim through because we want to go to questions. And yeah. guys, I want you to start your questions for this New York Times bestselling author, <laughs> Laura Coates. Laura Coates, bestselling author, New York Times bestselling author. You are author. so lovely. You are so lovely and funny. Thank you. <laughs> no, it's not funny. I mean, you were talking. People don't understand. I'm in the throes of my next book that's coming out in October. I'm mm. hoping to get where you are. So yes. So anyway, well, chapter yeah. 30. Well, we all we all know, and I hope you know, we all appreciate and respect and look up to you and all of your journalistic integrity. And you are so, I mean, you're on the front lines and you hold it down when you're there. And, and I, I really appreciate what you do. And it's not easy. And in many respects, I think you probably have your own, in a sense, personal battles of allegiance of trying to figure out how to present the information and to compartmentalize one's feelings about it, to use that as advocacy. And I, I know when I see you grapple at times with the idea of, do I get the information or do I offer a perspective? And what, how is the community better served? That part. Now moving on <laughs> to chapter 13. You are absolutely right. You hit the nail squarely in the head, the chew on the role mm. of privilege in charging decisions. Um, charging decisions, the mm -hmm. role of privilege. We just watched court proceedings in Georgia. Yes. Where race was front and center. And justice rolled down like a mighty stream in the sentencing. But talk to me about this. After we go from you being told how to handle these defendants and now to charging. Talk to me about the privilege in that. We, we, we think about it, we think it's there, but you tell us it's there, talk to me. I do, and, and I should point out, one of the things that I did intentionally is that this is a really episodic book and each chapter stands alone. And yeah. each really personifies a different issue that's in the zeitgeist. Mm -hmm. And this one talks about the elements of privilege and just the way in which 
how we view as a society who's entitled to be thought of as a victim, um, the ways in which prosecutors sometimes will decide how to use the limited resources when you are balancing violent cases versus nonviolent, the spectrum of it, and how you decide to prioritize. And it might surprise you oftentimes that what you consider to be egregious, prosecutors are looking at like, I've got 15 cases today alone that outrank mm -hmm. this in severity. But what can move that needle and make it move up and down sometimes is the indignation of the victim who believes they're entitled to a different result and sometimes for nefarious reasons. And I write about in this chapter sort of the process of having an officer bring you a case and say, here are the facts, what do you wanna do? And what you do in terms of thinking about how to prosecute or not, and what happens when someone believes, well, hold on, I look at prosecutors and law enforcement, not as public servants, but as conduits and agents to get what I want. That's what I'm going to use you for. I'm going to pull mm -hmm. strings because I'm privileged in some way. And I really point out in this, the idea of the tenacity of somebody who is, doesn't have the right motives, who's trying mm -hmm. to use the benefits of privilege to dictate your discretion and how often that happens in our justice system. How did you as a black woman stand in the midst of this privilege? Because the judicial system has not always been kind mm -hmm. to the community that we are a part of. How did you stand? Because so many people go in and say, oh, I'm gonna go in to change the system. Change is very slow. The scales of justice have not been balanced as of yet. Right. But how did you view and how did you try to change the privilege that you have been seeing in the system? You know, I was a beneficiary of a kind of privilege that was unique to being a prosecutor and a part of law enforcement, so to speak, in that how often have you heard people say, well, officer didn't get up in the morning to commit a crime. The officer didn't do anything other than just do his job or her job or the government wouldn't have prosecuted had they not had a case. There's a benefit of the doubt. That's a form of privilege that extends to prosecutors and to the government. And no one wants to be on the other side of United States versus because of the weight of resources and those assumptions that we are benefiting from. And so I found myself having to be very cognizant of that benefit of that benefit of the doubt and not exploiting it. And it can be tempting because it's an advantage to think, well, I can sort of phone in my burden of proof. I didn't mm -hmm. feel that way. I didn't rely on the privilege of the benefit of the doubt. I think you had to prove your case. And you know what that meant sometimes? That when I stood up and said, Laura Coates on behalf of the people of the United States, that necessarily included the defendant and wow. his or her rights and whether I was honoring that person's civil rights, constitutional rights, and at times having to act as their advocate for things that I knew as a prosecutor were exculpatory evidence, or even those blink moments I write about in the book of the, that moment when, which of course happens every second in a criminal courtroom, someone professes their innocence as they're entitled to do. But what if in those moments you have that blink moment and say, you know, what if, what if the officer did get it wrong? What if this really is the wrong person? It really is mistaken identity. What would it take for you to use your resources even for a moment and not just go the extra mile, go the extra inch to use the resources of the federal government to figure out if the defendant is entitled to that benefit of the doubt? And I think that has really shaped the way I think about how um, this fallacy that you can't be civil rights minded and be a prosecutor. You've got to be civil rights minded to be a prosecutor. You've got to be against this fallacy that black and brown people are only entitled to be in one position in a courtroom, either that is defendant or defense counsel. And I write about in a chapter, a distinction of a conversation between myself and black defense counsel where I was challenged as to how could I have the audacity to think I was a civil rights lawyer and be standing where the so-called man ought to be. And I just really believe that if we think about reform and think about this system and working within it, you have to be in every, at every table, in every room, 
not only as a gatekeeper and an exerciser of discretion, but reactive as well. And that means cops, prosecutors, defense counsel, on the bench, up to and including the Supreme Court. Wow, civil rights minded, civil rights minded. So, and before we go to questions, I'm gonna to go to chapter six. Mm. A seat at the right table. Yeah. Now this, this you, have, you have to break this down on the tension between black defense attorneys and prosecutors. Mm -hmm. You are polar opposites fighting for two different things. So it would that's seem, yeah. So it would seem, but really we are not. And that's part of the idea of it. And I, this is, mind you, in this chapter, I want to be clear, I was minding my own business. <laughs> I was having a meal at my particular table, having a moment of escapism for lunch. When I was approached by a Black defense counsel who wanted to try to understand who I thought I was. Why are you, why are you in the wrong? I mean, you, you think you're talking about justice. You want to be a defense counsel if you really care about justice. And through this conversation of us both feeling that we were at the right seat at the table, we came to the sort of this, this, this head of tension about what it means to occupy those different spaces. Is it better to be in the proactive position where you can exercise discretion from a holistic way and bringing one whole, one's whole self into the room? or to have to react to the decisions that have already been made, knowing the resources against and this pseudo presumption of innocence we have to pay for in this society. And we talk, I talk about that. It was something that would happen with black defendants. It would happen with black defense counsel. And mind you, in Washington, DC, my victims were overwhelmingly black and brown. Mm. So this tension that only that I was somehow betraying when I was advocating on behalf of black and brown people as victims was always very odd to me. It's a tension that I did not experience in the voting section of the Civil Rights Division, where it was a foregone conclusion on whose side I was on, a foregone conclusion of where my allegiance lay, as opposed to a criminal prosecutor where even under the same umbrella of the Department of Justice, it was a, viewed as this perception that I was somehow acting against a community. And you know you you cannot please everyone. That sounds yes. familiar. That sounds very familiar mm -hmm. um, with other prosecutors who are at the highest levels. Um, we've heard that about um, Vice, President Vice President Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris. Yeah. Um, I remember watching and feeling a sense of kindred spirit with her um, when she was uh, going through her own campaign, and the questions that were raised about can this really be a champion of the people? And I thought to myself, you know, first of all, if we're really thinking about it in the political terms, you realize the org chart of the government is the head of the executive branch oversees mm -hmm. the Department of Justice. <laughs> so they enforce the laws, right? Don't you want someone with the experience of law enforcement to be in that position? Number one. Number two, it was again this notion of thinking to yourself, wait, it's a... It really is a um, either or, it's binary. Either you can be civil, in civil rights or you can be a prosecutor. Well, what does that mean? I think to myself about, you know, what that leads to, April. Yeah. If we are not in those rooms and in positions of power, then who is there? And when that happens, what does justice look like then? You got to be in the room where it happens. The, the room, room where, where it happens. happens. The, the room, room where it happens. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, <laughs> another another shameless plug for <laughs> Hamilton. Um, I love so, it. So again, New York Times bestseller, Just Pursue. It's so Mark nice. Cousin. Yes, it's so nice. It's so nice. So at this moment, I want to go to questions, and as I, I'm on my tablet, everyone, um, as I go to questions, I'm going to say this, though, Laura, um, I did, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Chris Darden, yes, Chris Darden from the O.J. Simpson trial, prosecutor, former prosecutor, he said to me, and, and, and about that comment that you were talking about prosecuting, and prosecuting, unfortunately, a large swath of the community that we live in, he said, you know, you don't, when you prosecute, you're not saying, oh, I'm just gonna prosecute black and brown people. 
you prosecute because that's what you're there to do. But he said, and he, because he helped me understand this, this, this controversy. And he said, but once you see the numbers, you handle and approach it in a very different way. Is that true? You know, I think that's such an important statement. And you know what I, I think about it? Um, the best way I can describe it really is it's one thing to know intellectually about disproportionate impact of the criminal justice system on black and brown communities, right? We know this, it's sort of a, a topic of discussion, in every reform conversation. I knew that intellectually, mm -hmm. but until you're there, you don't fully understand the parade of black and brown men and women in the courtrooms in this country. I oversaw or prosecuted hundreds of thousands of cases as a prosecutor. I can count on one hand, April, the number of white defendants I ever saw in the courthouse. Not just my own courtroom, I ever saw in the courthouse. And I don't even need all five fingers. Now, do black and brown people have a monopoly on crime? Absolutely not. Were a lot of my officers black and brown themselves? Absolutely they were. So what does that tell you about the directives of the policing priorities? What does it tell you about the idea of in a place like even Washington DC and in a country where black and brown people remain the racial minority overwhelmingly that somehow we are disproportionately represented as criminal defendants. And I equate it with the idea of I know on a, on a train platform, I, I know the power of a locomotive. I know what happens when those pistons start firing and I know it's ferocity and speed. I know that intellectually, but when I'm on a train platform and all of a sudden one flies by me, requiring me to take a step back and appreciate the power of that moment and what it could do and by force it could do, that's what it was like being in a criminal courtroom after intellectually understanding the impact of race and bias in our justice system. Takes your wow. breath away. It does, it does. And I thank you so much for breaking it down like only you can. Now let's go to, <laughs> let's go to questions. This is from an anonymous attendee. I've got a couple of people who are putting their names. This is an anonymous attendee, the first question I received. Hello, Laura. I'd love to hear you talk about asymmetrical expectations and scrutiny placed on women of color. Have you experienced the feeling of being, quote, under a microscope in ways your white male colleagues have not? Good Every question. Every day. Every day. Obviously, um, in the work I do, it's highly visible. And I don't think that we're afforded the same opportunity for second chances and redemption. I think the benefits of the doubt that happen in a courtroom, in our justice system, sometimes play out in other areas of the court of public opinion. And um, I am fallible like anyone else, but misstatements are regarded as somehow illustrations of a lesser intellect, whereas misstatements from colleagues perhaps or white male counterparts or other counterparts in general are regarded as, oh, well, maybe I was mistaken into what I thought was the truth. Now, that's one of the things I often see. And also the idea, I, I realize, and I drink a lot of water and my mother happens to have wonderful skin. So I look young, <laughs> I look very young. And I realize that. And I sometimes feel um, maybe at times a bit of imposter syndrome being imposed on me as to what do you think you're doing here? I am I lived through Watergate and you read a book about it, right? And this idea of condescension about whether you are, um, whether you know enough to speak about the issues. And I, um, I believe in myself and my mind, and I don't allow self-doubt or somebody else's impressions to dictate how I feel about myself. But I often am feeling I'm under a microscope of the, in, those, in those notions. But you know, the idea of the hyper-qualifications in particular, when I see in media, the skill set that black and brown men and women must have in order to thrive mm. it is in stark contrast to what I see in other arenas. And um, I'm not other taking people away. can be mediocre. We have to be great. Mm, well, I, it's just, it's great, just great, the, it great is the floor. <laughs> great is the floor. Great is the floor. That's, and that's why I go back to even the discussions about the Supreme Court. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, the resumes 
and the experience level of the women that you will see on this short list, when you compare and contrast, your eyebrows will be at your temple mm. um, wondering what took so long. Mm. Laura Coates, New York Times best-selling author, just <laughs> made that today. <laughs> I'm not, I'm, let me tell you something, that is no small feat. And I'm gonna celebrate you. That's one thing I do. I celebrate people, particularly women, black women who look like me. I will celebrate you. And sister, you have done this thing. And Thank I'm you. so proud of you. And I'm proud of you listening to you articulate what it is to be who you are in this system. And for Thank times such as this, it's so important. Next question. I can emote and go on. For Thank long. you. Yes, Laura, um, Laura, what is this? Lori, okay. Uh, Laura, you are, well, it's from Lori Levin. Laura, you are an inspiration to working moms. Can you say a few words about what skills you think parenthood has given you or enhanced that have proved helpful to your career? That's a nice question. That is, a, I, I think I know this person. I, I wonder if it's the same Lori that I'm thinking of, which would be so wonderful. Um, I gotta tell you the I think, what has made me better through motherhood is the ability to use the limited amount of time I am given to accomplish a task. My efficiency is far better than it was prior to having children by virtue of the limited time constraints that I have. And my, um, I think also it's helped me in the ability to synthesize information and to relay it. How often do we have, I know I have, my kids are seven and nine years old, but I remember the years of the why, 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 having to narrow it down to an answer that will satisfy and educate all at once is a skill that I certainly have to use in the creation of and discussions of sound bites on air. The idea of cutting right to the point, addressing exactly what you wanted to know and doing it in a way that is digestible and accessible. That's a skill set I think that motherhood has really um, emphasized even more. And then for all mothers, I think it's, um, I don't know if it's a, it's not a thought of as, as a tangible skill, but I have certainly become all the more empathetic in my approach to life because of my children and realizing even as a prosecutor, this was somebody's child. And I, I approached it from a different level of respect for that reason. Next question um, from Nick Nelson, Laura April, big fan of both of you here and really appreciate the work you do on behalf of the people. Laura, as you made your transition to commentary, what was one of the most challenging topics you've had to discuss on air where you may have found yourself on the less popular side of the issue? Ooh, that's a good question. Mm, that's a great question. You know, office, what comes to mind are some of the cases involving officer involved shootings um, and the explanation surrounding the bad apple theories. And um, I think the, the instinct and the knee jerk reaction is often when we see these cases to, to jump on the bandwagon that suggests that all members of law enforcement are nefarious in their intent. That is not the case. And I've worked with so many honorable police officers who really believed in their role as public servants and wanted to have a symbiotic and trusting relationship. And I think even sometimes even conveying that level of reality that everyone cannot be considered a monolith sometimes poses a challenge to people, as does when you call balls and strikes. The umpire behind the plate depending upon whether you're in favor of the team that got the ball or the strike, the beer is thrown at you nonetheless. And so I call balls and strikes all the time. And depending on what team you're on, you will either appreciate it or condemn it. And I'm, I'm comfortable not being a people pleaser because my role is to provide information as a form of activism, yeah. frankly, and education. So it happens often, but I, you know, we got the umpire mask on sometimes April. <laughs> In that, in that respect. And you get beat up when you try to tell the fact and, yes. you know, and not try to people please. Um, yeah, you, easy, you do. Yeah, nasty. You know. Yeah, you I know, know this. I lived it. Got a t-shirt washed and wore it again. So anyway, <laughs> uh, next question. 
Um, sometimes it feels like laws are extremely stubborn and immovable when it comes to progressive movements, but uncomfortably loose and vague in situations that are truly concerning, i.e. gun rights, qualified immunity, et cetera. What efforts towards justice, legislative reform are you in favor of, if any? And that's from an anonymous attendee. You know, there's so many. First of all, I'm glad that the question actually contemplates a world of reform outside of the specific instances of police encounters. So often we think about justice reform and the first thing people think about is the idea of police encounters in the Fourth Amendment. Very important to consider, very important to tackle and resolve, but it's only a part of the story. Yes, issues of qualified immunity must be addressed. It's a judicially, judicially created doctrine that I hope the Supreme Court reevaluates, as is their case of Graham versus Connor, which talks about the benefit of the doubt you extend to police officers, giving them and allowing them to be judged by a reasonable officer standard, as opposed to a reasonable person standard, which is really a high bar for many prosecutors who want to go forward with cases, but are afraid they could not meet that particular burden because of that skewed perspective. And of course, the Derek Chauvin trial is an example of what happens when reasonable officers take the stand to say, this is not what we would have done nor should have done, and it changed the ball game. Another instance, of course, is this idea of a presumption of innocence. We know we are supposed to have this, but yet we force people to pay for that presumption of innocence, not because they might be a threat to the community if they are released, but because money makes the world go round. And these bail, these bail prices allow a type of infrastructure to happen in the community. And it's the, it's the detriment of those who are most impacted. And I can't tell you what a particular burden it is for defendants to have a presumption of innocence and be unable to afford bail to meet with their attorneys, to continue to be gainfully employed, to have their role in the community, to have and help with evidence or whatever it might be, not to have the pressure of, I got to get out of this jail cell. So tell me what the plea is again, even if I'm innocent. That's a difficult um, thing to deal with in the society. And then, of course, you've got what Congress can be doing and about what the state and local governments can be doing in terms, in terms of not benefiting from census data involving prisoners who are in the area um, and disregarding them as if they only matter for the census count to get better amenities in your community and discard them on the other side. And finally, one of the areas, there's, there's so much more I could say, but one of the areas that I actually wrote about in my senior thesis for, for college was on restoring voting rights for those who are um, felony convicted. And um, it, you can imagine it wasn't the most popular interview note when I interviewed in the Bush, White, the Bush administration Department of Justice. But I even then was like, well, this is what I feel and um, had to res resolve what the actual law would say and whatnot. But it's no coincidence that our criminal justice system and one's record is tied to the, with the removal of a right so powerful. And we've got to explore that. Yeah, it is powerful. Um, you know, I want to go to something lighter right now, and then we're going to go back into some heavy stuff. Um, we have an anonymous attendee who wants to know some of your um, TV watching habits. But before we go into that question, Woo! <laughs> you know where I'm going. Jeopardy? <laughs> I mean, they even wrote a song about the talk show. And then here you go telling us what, what happened. What happened? I had several friends who were who I thought you and and Jonathan, I was like, oh, they could be the Jeopardy host. Well, what happened? You know, well, first let me say I I was as shocked as anyone else when Mr. Trebek said my name. I have watched Jeopardy my whole life. It's something that I watch with my parents and my family to this day and, and, and love it. And um, have always loved the, the sort of intellectual exercise of it. And um, when he said my name, I was so surprised and humbled and did not know him personally and was able to thank him for saying that. And I thought it was just so, I was folding laundry when I heard it. That's the life of mom. What, I was like, what now? Huh? What did he say? Mom, and my laundry. son was like, mommy, Trek Trek knows you, which is like, that's what they called him at that point. I said, okay, what's going on? So, um, and I was just so sad to watch his battle with pancreatic cancer because my own grandmother passed away from that disease and to have it claim another life 
is just unconscionable in any world. And I'm just so sorry that his family continues to um, grapple with his loss. Um, when a time came for them looking for guest hosts, I raised my hand and I was my own That's champion good, yeah. and I advocated for it. And I, I wanted the opportunity to try. I didn't feel entitled to the spot. I didn't feel entitled to the actual hosting position, but I wanted the opportunity to have a chance. And they said no, and no uncertain terms did not allow me to um, endeavor to even try. And they didn't feel it was persuasive that he himself thought that it would be something to recommend. And you know what? I have to tell you, um, the universe has a funny way of showing you what a path is. And I can tell you to this day, I, I, I know what my calling is. And my calling, I firmly believe, April, is to keep asking questions, keep giving the answers, and to keep my community out of jeopardy. And that's where I see this. That part, yes. <laughs> yes. You see what I did there? You see what I did there? Yes. yes. <laughs> you're, you're playing on words, you're fun. Yes, yes. But it's a, it's a reminder to wear your own jersey. I'm, I will always be my own champion and it's always a pleasant surprise if others are too. So here's what we're gonna do. Laura for 500, please. Okay, moving on. So, um, so there's someone who asked the anonymous person, they wanted to know what were your viewing habits when it comes to uh, court dramas? Do you have any suggestions? <laughs> Ooh, oh my gosh. Ah, oh. well, I watch all the crazy classics, of course. And I, every day I, I always try to figure out, is there a way I could quote a few good men or my cousin Vinny or something during a CNN hit? <laughs> And who would notice if I did? Sometimes Tubin and I actually will have a joke like, I'm gonna quote the Godfather at some point. He's like, why do you keep trying? What's, what's happening right now? So there are, there are moments of um, thinking about how I, I, I weave those in, but I, I, I tend to watch, in all honesty, I tend to watch things that are not legally oriented when it comes to my escapism. And I watch a lot of television to the point where April, I most nights don't go to bed until one o'clock in the morning because and I'm up by six, but I like to have that moment of sort of pure escapism. So whether it's things like Squid Games or um, Lupine, uh, the French detective show, or it's something like The Real Housewives, or it's a great movie. I, I if it's Hitchcock, all the, I'll watch it 20,000 times. Whatever Mindless it is, I just, entertainment. I just, want, I just want to feel, and I sometimes want to escape and, um, I, was, I suspect much like doctors don't want to watch ER, sometimes I'm like, no, no, I want to escape. And mostly because, you know, as a prosecutor, the whole CSI effect and law and order effect made your life harder to be like, no, in 48 minutes, you're not going to have the crime committed, the arrest, all the DNA, surveillance video and everything you need and a conviction to walk down the courthouse steps. It's not going <laughs> right. to happen. So right. I tend to stay away at times. Yeah. Yeah, um, but I'm guilty of watching mindless things. I'm a reality show buff because I have to get totally away from all of that. Yes. Other, it's, too, it's too much. It's too much all day, all night. I, it's, yeah. so I watch we, things like Shit's Creek, which is this S-C-H-I-T-T-S. I did not just swear, politics and prose. I watch stuff. I mean, I, I, will, I will binge watch a show. I'll watch Ted Lasso, but you know what I do? I actually will make the food in the show and I'll be like, a Ted Lasso biscuit? How you make that? And I'll go and make it and then come back and go, okay, okay. Please don't say that because I have people in my house who do those kinds of things. <laughs> oh, let's make it. I'm like, no. That's me. That's me. I'll watch the show and be like, hmm, and move on. Mm -hmm. so, um, <laughs> so we are people too. Okay, so especially after you do all of those crazy, crazy things, dealing with everything that you deal with during the day, you need decompression time. Woosa. Um, Woosa. So now um, I want to, since I'm an HBCU, or I've got to go to the HBCU community. There's a woman by the name of Lauren Robinson. Hello, Ms. Coates. My name is Lauren Robinson, and I'm a sophomore criminology major, Afro-American studies and Spanish dual minor at Howard University. Following my matriculation, I intend to go to law school and pursue a career as a prosecutor. You are one of my biggest inspirations, and it would truly be an honor of mine to work with you 
or for work with you or for you one day? Do you offer internships or mentorships to undergraduate students that plan to pursue a similar career path, similar career path as you did? That's so sweet. That is so sweet. And I cannot wait to welcome you as a colleague. And I'm so glad with all the things you are juggling that you see why it's important to have a seat at that particular table. So more power to you. And I would encourage you, I, I absolutely do mentor and absolutely do offer opportunities. So write me, you can look at, at my website, lauracoats.com and connect with me. I, I'm responsive about making sure that people feel as though there is a community and that um, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And I'm more than happy to impart whatever you deem to be my wisdom. If it helps you in any way, I'm so excited to do so. And, and I look forward to hearing from you. So that's wonderful. And I think I have time. We, we have four minutes left. Um, and thank you guys for chiming in. Yeah. Um, and this is going to be the last question, Laura. Um, what are the greatest legal challenges facing civil rights today? My mind goes to voting rights because it is the predicate for which all other rights will follow. And um, if we do not take seriously the idea that a democracy cannot be strong if voting rights are weak, that the concept of voting rights is not an inherently partisan issue, that voting rights does not guarantee that you get to vote for the winner, but it means equal access and fair participation. If we don't get to that point, then no other right or law will matter. Everything else will be suspect. If you think you have a notion of what fraud as a pretext could look like, imagine mm. a democracy that doesn't really have the ability to say that it's representative of the people of the United States, that it's of, for, and by the people. To me, it goes right there every single time. And we have to be not only vigilant, but really working with members of Congress to remove any political hurdles that might stand in their way. And finally, I just wanna remind people, it's sort of my weekly reminder, that civil rights is not just an era. <laughs> it's incumbent to actually be exercised and um, upheld at every juncture and voting rights is where it begins. Mm. Oh, let me give you a, here, I'll give you a kiss, a book kiss. Mwah! <laughs> just pursue, just pursue. Oh, York, you too. That's right, Mwah! that's right, <laughs> New York Times bestselling author, Laura Coates. Laura, it's been a pleasure to spend this hour with you. Congratulations on all you've done. Congratulations, congratulations. And Brad, I throw it back to you. Thank you. Hey, great, great moderating, April. Uh, you know, you, you're really good at this. I, I, think, I think we'll have you back. You know? uh, um, <laughs> we've been doing this for a lot of years now. <laughs> I know. And Laura, what, what, what uh, a, a truly great achievement. I mean, as you said earlier, we, we, we've known intellectually how unjust the justice system has been, but you were there and you've managed to turn your experiences as a black prosecutor into a, a gripping, heartbreaking and, and compelling book. Um, no wonder it's now a New York Times bestseller. Um, did we say that enough times in the past hour? Um, we are dying every enough. time. Can't say it enough. <laughs> I've got a Sunday waiting for me to celebrate. <laughs> So to, uh, to everyone watching, thanks for tuning in. A reminder that in the chat column, you can find a link for purchasing additional copies of Just Pursuit. From all of us here at Politics and Prose, stay well and well-read. <laughs>